You are listening to Mining Stock Education, where you'll learn from the top leaders in the natural resource sector and uncover quality mining investment opportunities. Welcome back to Mining Stock Education. I'm your host, Bill Powers, and you're in for a treat today. In today's episode, I'm joined with Brian Lenny of JuniorStockReview.com to help me ask questions to do to two very successful and intelligent strategic resource investors in the junior mining sector. I'm talking about Dave Lotan, as well as Michael Gentile. Uh, all three gentlemen, thank you for coming on the show. And Brian, I'm going to kick it over to you for the first question, please. Thanks, Bill. Um, so this first question is for Michael. Um, many junior resource companies sell a discount to value. Um, this can be for a variety of reasons, such as jurisdiction, under promotion, or maybe the focused metal um, that they're looking for is out of favor. Obviously, a company has to get its value recognized by overcoming these reasons. As a value-focused investor in the resource sector, um, are you attracted to any specific type of discount at the moment or in general? Well, fortunately for investors, uh, Brian, uh, everything's on sale right now. <laughs> fortunately or unfortunately for us. <laughs> um, you know, Brian, I think I spent 17 years as an institutional money manager. So, you know, looking at companies with $150, $200 million mark caps and above. So really my focus when I was an institutional investor was either investing in companies that were mining already the commodity in question or very, very close or imminently close to mining. And so what I've tried to do in the junior resource sector is take a step back and say, okay, well, how do the companies get to become mines? And what are the five or 10 attributes that allow mines to become mines? And what are the attributes that don't allow it to become mines? And the 99 out of 100 that fail, you want to try to avoid those and find the one out of 100 that actually could become a mine and become a cash flowing asset in the future. So yeah, everybody thinks their stock is cheap. Everything is discounted versus to the fair value. But the real discount you want to look at, I think, in the sector is, does this have a shot to become a mine? I mean, the, the kind of investments that I think Dave and I are trying to make are investing in companies that we think have potential to be mines. And therefore, we have a three to 10 year, I don't want to speak for Dave, I apologize, Dave, but three to 10 year horizon when you make that investment. So a cheap stock is, is one thing, but a, a highly discounted stock that we think have 20 to 30 bagger potential and become a cash flowing mine one day, that's what really gets me excited. And that's where I want to spend my time. So I'd almost rather pay a, a lower discount, let's say, for something I have more certainty of becoming a mine than getting a really cheap stock that I know has no chance of ever becoming something more than a, than a speculation. Okay. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. So I guess maybe the better question for me to ask is maybe, is there, uh, you know, is maybe on the flip side is like, what would you absolutely avoid? And, and maybe, maybe the answer is too uh, straightforward because, um, you know, there's, there's companies that have discounts for very real reasons. Um, and, you know, obviously those are the ones you want to avoid. Okay. That's, that's, that's a good, very good answer. Thank you. Dave, any insights on that one too? Well, on the three to 10 year time horizon, I'm getting close to 10 on a lot of mine. <laughs> <laughs> so I wholeheartedly agree that one has to take a longer view of, uh, of, of the business plan and understanding that timeframes, especially in this day and age, are getting extended due to permitting and uh, increasing capital intensity and ESG and that, that sort of thing. Uh, so yes, you have to take that long-term view on complete agreement with that. And that's what investors uh, like Mike and hopefully like me bring, bring to companies and that is more patient capital and, uh, and an understanding of, of the elongated timeframes over which things uh, uh, occur, making sure that the company is prepared to deal with those, those delays properly capitalized and has uh, an understanding of, of, of current trade-offs. So, but more directly addressing your question, uh, Brian, uh, what, what's at a discount these days uh, that you should buy or avoid uh, well, you can't talk about making money in oil stocks uh, these days or, or in natural gas stocks, which I, I think personally should be less controversial. Some of those are still trading at the highest free cash flow yields uh, they, they have in history and in the market today. Uh, so there's interesting opportunities there. And I think natural gas is an important part of the green transition. So people can feel good about buying those opportunities. And I think what I avoid, even when it appears to be trading at discounts, are large resources uh, or seemingly economically significant resources that have been cheap uh, for a long time, uh, and therefore uh, the market must know something I don't. And and Mike, I think, has recently decided to to take on Genesis. Uh, which, which I think is a great opportunity and really just has needed uh, someone to come along and, and take that asset. And sorry, it is Genesis, isn't it, Mike? 
Correct. Yep. Yep. Yeah. I mean, and, and, you know, Quebec, for instance, is, is pockmarked with, with million ounce deposits or, or, or even greater than that. But it's never clear whether they will work or whether they won't work. And often they've been brought to fruition through multiple rounds of flow through rental capital and, 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 and are inside of companies that have been destroyed because they don't have a good capital allocator or someone who brings a good network to the opportunity. Uh, and so uh, if, if you've got uh, something that looks cheap, uh, often it's because management doesn't have the capability to, to, to bring it um, to, to release the economic value. So that's something to watch out for. Uh, obviously, Mike has seen some opportunities there and, 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 and gotten those companies into a situation where their cost of capital is much, much lower. Um, but if, uh, if it looks cheap, if it's got a resource and there isn't someone reputable involved, you should probably think twice about it. Dave, Dave, you mentioned patient capital. So both you and Michael bring catalytic, supportive capital. And could you talk through the philosophy of bringing catalytic, supportive capital, yet it not being predatory? In other, in other words, the terms aren't too good for you relative to everybody else. In general, uh, my activism in companies is, is accidental. Uh, I often uh, enter through the stock market end up taking a large position in something that I think is cheap and, and cheap based on the people, the structure of the company, you know, the number of shares it has outstanding, the cost to carry the asset and the asset itself. And in almost all cases where I've gone into public domain on a stock is because I took a large position in it, developed a relationship with management, and it, it became obvious over time that in most cases, they weren't able to address their financial needs. So I would offer some assistance in that regard, and uh, but almost always from the position of being its largest shareholder, and probably because I had invested unwisely. And, and not, not in getting the people wrong or getting the asset wrong, but uh, it was very easy in 2012, for instance, to think that things would turn around. The venture was already down by more than 50%. And so uh, I ended up in a lot of positions that, that um, we just kept going down and becoming a larger and larger shareholder. So in a few specific instances, and Orion is probably the best example, uh, we, uh, I collaborated with management in, in dealing with the distress. And, and my view at the time was uh, the only thing we could do was buy time for the company and control dilution. And in my view, give the company the best chance it could be, it, it, it could have to, well, I mean, we had a simple goal with Orion. When it was a three cent stock and, and didn't have any money, we just thought we'd done a 40 cent financing or Mike had done 40 cent financing a, a year or two before. We thought it would be a good start to go and get those people their money back. And the only way we thought we could do that was to buy the company time and so I debt financed it on relatively generous terms. Perhaps I should have taken security or some equity compensation for that. But in my view, the reward would be greater for all of us if the company regained access to capital markets. And so we made those distressed financings commercially irrational, to be frank, in order uh, to make sure that if markets turned, the company would have preferred access to capital. So that's a specific example. There are more, but I think that that's, uh, I think, I think we should hand it over to Mike from here. Mike. That's great insight. I think Dave's answer really illustrates the importance of having strategic cornerstone investors in your company. You mentioned bill patient capital versus not being too predatory. Uh, I think many, many, many mining companies make the mistake of being way too unthoughtful or not thoughtful enough about their capital structure and, and who they're selling shares to. So to me, there's two things when you do a financing that are really important is, is what's the price? Obviously, shareholders really look at that and most shareholders can evaluate that very quickly because it's in the press release. But even more important than what's the price is who you're selling the shares to. So if you're going to get a guy like Dave on your register who's patient, three to 10 year plus capital, who will try to do the right thing for the shareholders, I'd much rather sell shares to Dave at a very big discount because I know the value he's going to bring to the story. I know he's going to be there when the four-month hold is off. And he'll be there when the four-year hold is off probably as well. The story continues to evolve well. Versus a shareholder where you get maybe a, high, a slightly higher sticker price. So your retail shareholders are happy because there is less dilution. 
but those shelters are all blowing the stock out four months plus a day, clipping the warrant or fl- turning the capital uh, into an- another name. And so that you have to completely resell all those shares in the open market to find new buyers and your stock never gets the proper cost of capital to develop the story. So I spent a lot of time on who are we selling shares to? What are they bringing to the table? Are they going to be around for the long term? Can they write a second, a third, a fourth check if the story is going in a positive direction and the company needs more money and wants to drill more aggressively? And can they also help and keep the lights on in a really bad bear market so the shelters don't get obliv- obliviated uh, with dilution at that time. So that's something I think many companies I talk to don't think enough about. And someone like David or myself come in, we understand that nature of the game, that that helps companies really improve their cost of capital over time. Michael, I'm not asking you to name names, but if a retail investor is looking at a press release and it announces a strategic investor, what would be some things that a retail investor that doesn't have your knowledge of the sector, what should they look out for in terms of a potential strategic resource investor? Can you point us to anything more? I mean, it's a broad label, right? Companies try to say everything's strategic, right? If they're trying to raise money, but I think it's really what's what's their track record? You know, what do they bring to the table? What's the what, what's the previous involvement been in other names? Have they done well? They not? I mean, obviously in the junior expiration space, no one has a perfect record. Your failure is the norm, not the not the exception, right? So it's going to have a lot of. But what's what's their value add? You know, uh, look, CD filers. You know, if you look at my CD filings, I think I've made maybe fifteen or twenty strategic investments. I think I've sold sold one in the last five years, right? So uh, that page, when I say patient, sticky capital, I really, my actions back up my, my checks. And so really understand their track record, what they bring to the table, what they're going to do for the company, uh, you know, what, what, what doors they can open for the company are really, really important uh, in terms of understanding what they're going to do. But I, I obviously have a preference for strategic investors over taking the easiest dollar available at the time. You know, that would be, most companies do that. We need to raise money. It's the easiest path of least resistance. Let's take that money and move on. And that tends up hurting them for years in the, in the market after that. Thank you, Brian. Next question. Sure. This one's for Dave. Uh, in your previous interview with Bill, you spoke about the importance of understanding the psychology and full funds in the market. Uh, can you give us your thoughts on the current market psychology and your view of the current flow of funds? Doom. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I'm, I'm at the Canaccord conference uh, in uh, uh, Palm Springs right now, and I would say that the mood is uh, is subdued, to say the least. And and I think that um, this is a not an uncommon situation in markets where you have a formerly high flying sector of the market that is in steep decline. And while as raw materials investors, uh, initially we welcome a little bit of gas coming out of the souffle of the technology market and all these great fantasies. Uh, like the billions of dollars people are going to make in food delivery, uh, you uh, you very quickly uh, lose your uh, schadenfreude over that and then begin to become terrified because, of course, as uh, people get margin calls and as uh, there's wealth destruction going on in, in the, in, to the tune of multi-deca billions of dollars, liquidity is withdrawn from all sectors. And I've <laughs> yet to see... Uh, I've yet to see a major market correction, either in a large sector or in, in the market itself, where liquidity isn't withdrawn from gold uh, along the way. And uh, that is uh, often baffling and disappointing to gold investors, even though it seems to happen every time. So, uh, and I, I've, I've listened uh, to many of Mike's interviews and completely agree with him that the Federal Reserve is trapped. However, how job of convincing the market that he's going to raise rates seven or eight times in the coming years and and become the second the second Paul Volcker. I don't believe that's possible. However, at the moment, the market does, and that's all that matters. So we'll see just how far they can they can take uh, the battle against inflation uh, and where uh, where the where the trade-offs will become too high. Uh, but for the moment, uh, psychology is awful, and the flow of funds is to cash. I just say, you know, investing in commodities for most of my career. I mean, these are opportun- opportunities as well. I mean, it depends obviously. And they mentioned 2012; they can last. Uh, the opportunity can last a lot longer than you can stay <laughs> solvent or patient. But, uh, but I would say, you know, I think as a strategic investor in the resource sector, you want to be writing checks when there's blood in the streets, right? Companies. My phone's ringing off the hook now. The desperation level in some companies is is getting pretty high, and it probably stay higher the longer the market stays closed. So. You're definitely your odds of finding, you know, great assets 
to Brian's first question that highly distressed valuations uh, is much higher when they're desperate for capital. And when you're the only people writing checks, you can you can't dictate terms. And if you can show that you're bringing a lot of value to the table for that that check and they don't have any other options, the capitalist to me says this is a great opportunity, especially when your your thematic macro thesis which I'm still holding strongly to remains positive for the next five, 10 years for gold, then you know, blood in the streets is not a bad thing if you're liquid. If you're getting a margin call, yeah. I mean, I've lived through that early in my career. You learn your lessons, right? You stay off margin. Uh, you, you don't. You make sure you have the ability to write checks when others don't, and you don't get your stocks called away from you when things get tough. They always get worse than you think. And so I think the psychology as an investor is good to understand it. And if you can try to master where you are in that cycle, when there's blood in the streets and fear and, and apathy and despair, like they've seen in the conference this week, well, that's probably when you want to be a buyer. And when things feel amazingly good and everything feels awesome, that's probably when you want to sell or, or rain a bit of capital in for the next, the next rainy day. But most investors, unfortunately, do the opposite. And so they end up uh, in tough situations on the other side of these, of these downturns. Michael, at the end of 2015, there were some juniors that were trading at a discount to cash in the bank. And then there's some companies right now that are trading at about uh, cash, it, you know, in this environment. Oh, any comments there as a speculator looking at those opportunities? I mean, the junior space, they burn cash pretty quick. So that I would say that cash probably won't be there in 12 to 24 <laughs> months. But obviously, it's, it's, it's a sign bill of, of the, the negativity in the market. I remember in 2001, when the tech bubble burst, there was plenty of tech companies that were trading uh, below cash. So the, the, the things can get quite dramatic in, in these downturns. Per my comment, things can always get worse than you, than you think. But it just shows you the extent of opportunity available in a, in, a, in a margin call, liquidity crunch, like Dave mentioned earlier, in terms of opportunity set. You can pick up some really quality opportunities at very low valuations. You're probably 50% or 75% below their last financing price. They may still have half that cash in the bank still, and you can pick it up in the open market <laughs> on a fire sale today. So it's, it, it, it's an exciting time for me. As an investor, I actually enjoy these moments. As much as they hurt looking at your portfolio every day, they really provide incredible opportunities on the other side. If there's that many opportunities of publicly trading companies, would you not even entertain a lot of private codes that are approaching you for money because the companies that are trading and are, are already at a very uh, attractive discount? Well, I'm relatively averse to doing privates uh, in general. And one of the reasons most of the venture trades is if it is private uh, for, uh, for, for large parts of the year. And so there are a couple of things that, that cause junior resource stocks to trade. One is an improvement in the market and second is an improvement in their prospects. But often when the market, they're not generating news, they might as well be private companies anyways. Uh, when we turned around Orion, it really made no sense for it to be publicly listed because I was simply writing checks to keep it alive every month. And it's difficult to pay for an audit and to, to pay for uh, services, uh, listing fees, when in fact the company has no benefit of being public. But you want it to be public when the good things happen. And if it's private, when the market turns and there's an opportunity for it, you don't get any of the benefit of public markets. So I've generally not been a, a large investor in privates. And I also find privates are an invitation for multiple cash calls uh, that, that end up being a Spanish prisoner type grift, where you need to give them more money in order to get your original investment back. So for me, uh, privates... Uh, are not an opportunity. Um, and, and I often find management trying to talk me into the benefits of being private. They don't have to report on a regular basis. They don't have the pressure to produce news for the market. Well, management should report more regularly and they should feel the pr pressure to be responsive to their investors. And they should recognize that even though they're not traded, they are part of the market. So for me, private is often a hard no unless it's really, really got a defined business plan uh, to, to either stay private or to go public imminently and plausibly. Yeah, I agree, I agree with Dave. I just want to say that, you know, in general, Tono, Dave, you found that as well, but private's valuation expectations tend to be often way out of whack. Uh, I, I like the rigor and the tests of the public markets. So typically the privates have been shown in the past to come out with these big valuation expectations. And then I like to see them live through a couple of, public market cycles first and live through a moment like right now where a market slam shut and you're out of money and what's your, what's your available dollar where from your private, our last round was at 50 cents. So we want to do it at 75, but in my view often is that if you're a public company, you'd be trading at 20 cents with a full warrant right now. So I think typically the privates that come to me aren't pricing their deals properly or expectations are, are out of line. 
uh, or they're, you know, they're like, they've said they're two to three years in private land. You got to fund them perpetually to keep them alive. So I, I, I like the rigor of the public market and the sort of more of a fair assessment of where the company is and what their true cost of capital is versus privates can tend to stretch the boundaries of realistic valuations and, and try to reach for things that are not viable in the current market pricing uh, scenario. Good managers welcome the opportunity to raise capital from the maximum number of sources. So if you don't, uh, if you don't, uh, if you don't have ambitions to be public and to have multiple people bidding for your stock on a daily basis and multiple brokers competing for your financings and corporations competing to give you money, you don't want to maximize the number of participants who are, who are bidding to be part of your business. Uh, maybe, maybe you shouldn't be running a company. Excellent advice, Brian. Uh, the next question I'd actually like to hear, uh, how both of you answer this question. Um, for me, jurisdictional risk is an interesting subject because everyone has their own criteria for what constitutes risk. Uh, for some, jurisdictional risk is a discounting factor which allows you to buy top tier projects on the cheap. And for others, it's very much a limiting factor in the companies that they'll invest in. Um, so for, for you two, is jurisdictional risk an accepted um, or limiting factor in the companies um, that you viewed as investable? Well, I'll start off with that. Um, there's a price for everything. And you just need to ensure that, for instance, if you're going to participate in Mali as Mike has with Roscan, that you pay the, the right entry price. Uh, and, and that you're associating yourself with a good asset and, and with, with good people. Um, now, what's the price for Papua New Guinea? Well, I'm not so sure, so I don't go there. Uh, but uh, I, I wouldn't shy away from the Congo. I wouldn't shy away from Mali. I wouldn't shy away from, from PNG. Uh, I wouldn't shy away from Scandinavia, even though wages are high uh, and the cost of doing business there is higher because I like the social license that buys you. And I like the fact that people who work for you are, 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 are happy. So there are trade offs, and almost all of those trade offs can be resolved by the price you pay. Yeah, I agree with that, uh, Dave and Brian. I think you know. I think with today's point, I think investors will either overpay or underpay for jurisdiction risk quite quite often. I've made the point in a few interviews that obviously Finland's an amazing jurisdiction, Canada's an amazing jurisdiction, but investors tend to maybe overvalue the merits of tier one jurisdictions sometimes and overpay for for that jurisdiction because and there's a lot of issues in Canada, some parts of Ontario and BC, I and mean, you cannot develop a mine. So just because your assets in Canada or in the U.S. does not immediately mean that you should have a premium cost of capital advantage. So today's point, if you're getting an app, my, what I look at is when I get involved in the mine, what are the, what are the roadblocks in that jurisdiction from this becoming a mine, right? And for me, the scariest one is expropriation. Like that is there's, there's political noise, like there's regime change, there's political stuff that you don't see in Western democracies that happen in, in West Africa, but very rarely do you ever see mines getting expropriated or mining stopped in those countries versus you might see, you know, environmental activism or, you know, government obstruction of oil and gas pipelines or permitting or mining licenses in Canada, where mm -hmm. investors say, well, those mm -hmm. are great jurisdictions. I want to be involved, but understand the risk of every jurisdiction properly and price it properly. And so understand what you're paying for something and don't overvalue premium jurisdictions and don't dramatically undervalue less desirable jurisdictions. Do the work to understand the odds of success and any roadblocks that might be in the way of that investment and what's the price and what's the price you're paying and risking that properly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I can't think of, for instance, the better project than the one that Trilogy has in Alaska, and I can't think of a company that's done it better. And I can't think of a, of a company that has more broadly uh, one community support than Trilogy has uh, for their projects. Uh, and they make incredible sense for the American agenda to move to electric vehicles and, and to electrify many, many parts of, of the supply chain. And yet, somehow, a road permit that was granted was revoked. So jurisdictional risk uh, exists everywhere. And I think that it, it isn't, it isn't a, a complete truism, but first and most importantly, you need to have community support. And even in the worst countries and even in very difficult countries, for instance, like Peru, if you have community support, you can get projects uh, moving forward with, without any problems and then go hundred miles away. You won't get community support and you'll never even get a drill permit. So in my country, the U.S., you referenced a trilogy, which is a very disappointing uh, occurrence. 
the Department of Justice about two weeks ago announced the, the new division of environmental justice that is going to work with the EPA. So when I saw that, I just read into that more bureaucracy, more red tape, more people saying no to projects. And I further read into that, uh, basically giving a voice to a lot of the far left NGOs that will oppose mining projects no matter what. So the trend clearly seems to be in the United States that things are getting more difficult to move a project forward. So, Michael, any commentary from north of the border of what's occurring in my nation specifically? Are you less hesitant to go into the United States? But if you're willing to go into the United States, is it just on private land and not BLM land or forestry land? I think in general, Bill, it's getting more difficult everywhere to to build projects. I think, you know, Dave, and you guys were talking offline before the interview started just about, you know, the the, the green transition is an is a admirable goal. But if you actually lay out on paper the amount of these critical EV metals that we need to actually complete this transition, I mean, governments are doing everything in their power to make it more, more expensive, more complicated and unachievable every single day. You, you've basically cut off the bridge fuel, which should be natural gas. You've basically made it impossible to permit projects or very, very difficult to permit projects. So where are these metals going to come from? But I think in general, yes, you're right. The, the projects are getting harder and harder to permit. The timelines are, are stretching out longer and longer. But if you actually map out the amount of metal we need, you should be removing bureaucracy, obviously in an environmentally sustainable matter, but you should be hitting accelerator on quality projects that are doing all the right things in the community. They're doing the right environmental stewardship lessons, not making it harder to do that because you're shooting yourself in the foot. You're you're ensuring that there's more coal and more dirty carbon fuels that can be burned in the future to bridge that gap. It's going to be forever farther away in the future. So, you know, your question is a micro and a macro on a big level. I think the governments are making it more difficult to achieve the goals they say they want to achieve by, by making these permitting regimes ever more stringent and more difficult. On the micro side, you've really got to get in the weeds of every project. Obviously private patented land in the U S is the best situation you can be under. But today's point, if you don't have community support and you're private patent the land, you're still going to have issues. Uh, and so every project is different. Uh, what's the government power? What's the regime in place? What's the permitting law, the timeline, how quickly, how guaranteed you have a timeline to get a response when you put a permit in? Is there enough bureaucrats in place to answer your questions when you have them? It's very, very much micro on a, on a project level. You really have to get in the weeds to understand the pathway. But in general, the level of difficulty is going up on any project. I don't see an area where it's getting easier to build a mine globally in any jurisdiction. Uh, so this question, again, it, it could, it could, it's, it'd be interesting to hear what you both have to say about this. Um, and it's, it's remember like, this is more directed toward the retail investor that's watching this. Cause I know you guys might have a, a little bit different view of this question, but in my view, many investors, investors focus a lot of their attention on what buy price, um, what what price to buy a company at and put little thought into what price they should sell it at. They end up riding the, the share price up and it, it meets their expectation. They think I'm going, this is going to the moon. And then we hit a, a like a roadblock like this and it's the comes right back down and they unfortunately ride it right back down the other side. And from my experience from hearing the different stories and I've done it myself, you know, you sell at the bottom. Um, so in your view is selling at the right price, just as important as buying at the right price. Um, well, look, I would say there's two things. When you're writing a strategic investment size check that Dave and I might write to become an insider filer, then you know typically our our exit would hopefully be a liquidity event for the company or some time of transaction. So that's one thing. But I would say most of your investors I'm watching this call are not doing that. So I'd say putting my institutional money management hat on, really great question, Brian. I'd say whenever you buy a stock, focus on the buy point, but you should also have a valuation framework of what you think it's worth and have the discipline to understand, okay, if I think a stock's worth a dollar, and I want to buy it at 20 cents. Well, if the stock is 98 cents, just because you're feeling great because it went up 450% or 500%, it's hit your buy price. It's hit your fair valuation. It's hit the, the valuation you think is a fair price for the company. You probably wouldn't buy more shares today at a company at 98 cents if you think it's worth a dollar. So in all likelihood, you should be selling the shares. What investors normally do is they look at a stock at 20 cents. They think it's really attractive. They don't do anything. It goes up to 85 cents. And okay, I guess my thesis is right. And then they buy it finally at that point in time because they go, the market's proving that this is a good stock to own. And then it pulls back to 30 cents and they sell it. And so that's, so you have to have the discipline on the way in to have a game plan for your buy, why you're buying it. What are the reasons why I'm buying it? What's the f- price it's likely to go to if I'm correct? And then sell if that happens. And also if you buy a stock and you have five reasons why you bought it and four to five are wrong three months later and the stock is down 20%, sell it. Your thesis is broken. You know, you've, you made a mistake. We, Dave and I make mistakes all the time. It's what part of investing is doing. But admitting your errors is what actually saves you even more money than being right oftentimes. And so if you don't have a game plan on the way in, 
you're likely to, the market's going to throw so many curveballs at you and so much fear and greed and volatility, you're probably going to mess it up. So having, I like to write things down on paper. I'm an old school, write by pen. Here's my thesis, one page on, I obviously have a lot more work behind that, but one page to remind myself as to why I'm in the stock, what I expect to happen, what are the catalysts, what'll happen if I'm right. And that way, if six months from now, I can't lie to myself. If I'm reading my own handwriting saying, here's what I thought and completely off base, I should probably be exiting the stock at that point in time. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I, I think that there are many reasons why a stock will go up that have nothing to do with its fundamental value. And, and as I've said in the past in interviews, psychology and flow are important to me. And for instance, if you want to talk about flow assets, there's no greater flow asset than Bitcoin, which is an asset that goes up in price when more dollars come in into it on a day than depart from it in a day uh, or, or in any given period of time. And speculative investments are very much uh, flow assets, and their value is often driven by psychology. So if you're buying an asset because you think it's undervalued, and I think Trillion would be a great example of that, Bill, lots of book value there and lots of value that could be unlocked with a small amount of money, then as that asset gets closer to the value that you estimate, and it's very estimable, uh, then you may want to think about taking some money off the table. If, however, you're buying something because you think you have a superior insight into future flows into the, into the stock, uh, then uh, you should be uh, you should you should be able to describe why you think inflows will overwhelm outflows. Uh, you should probably know who who's going to sell it and who's going to buy it. Uh, and uh, I mean, Charlie Munger rec recommends against the Keynesian beauty contest for a very good reason. It's the toughest one to win because you're not even the contestant. You're just the judge trying to guess who the other judges will vote for. And getting that right can be enormously profitable. And many people let stocks go too early because they underestimate the sort of compounding and flows that will happen as, as price signals are generated. However, it's really tricky. And, uh, and that, that's, that's the hardest way to invest. So if you're betting on flows... Uh, you better have a roadmap, as Mike suggests. And if you're betting on on uh, on a mean reversion to the actual value of the assets, that's even easier to determine empirically. Mike, putting on your institutional hat, which you've referenced, uh, going back to those days, when you would look at analyst reports and price targets, did you put any credence in the price targets where they have any value to you? Um. There's a bit of a it's, it's a game. I call it some, games are not a nice word, but you know, analyst covers a stock. At two dollars, who thinks today's point fundamental value is twenty dollars long term? They'll they'll never put a twenty dollar price target on a stock. There, there's a bit of a stair step approach that they use. So they'll say two dollar target, strong buy four dollars, and then the stock will go to four dollars, and they get further confirmation. They'll go from four dollars to eight dollar target, and, and so on and so on. Right. Uh, so I think analysts have a lot of value. I talk to them quite often, still do my new institutional venture that I'm starting. But I use them really. They're, they're encyclopedias of knowledge. They know these companies better than ninety nine percent of investors on the street. But the job of an institutional money manager and investors is to come to their own conclusion. So I would ask them their opinion, the facts, information on the permitting, on the geology, on the timelines, on the history of the asset, on the management. But my job as a portfolio manager is to make a decision for my clients. And so they're very valuable. But uh, early on, really early on in my early 20s, my career, you know, you see an analyst support sales, a strong buy, $20. I got to buy it because so and so said they buy it. But you learn quickly, you got to do your own work. Right. And so. That, that's key uh, to me, but the price target really should be generated by, by your own due diligence, your understanding, and your price target can be vastly different than what the analyst price targets are. And that's okay. It's different, different mindset, different longer term view or different valuation paradigm you may have versus the analyst. Uh, this one's for Dave. <clears throat> in my view, we live in a society of paradigms or bias that lock us into thought patterns that keep many of us blind to other alternatives, alternatives that may be more efficient or beneficial. Whether it be financial, political, or social, in your opinion, how does one keep an open mind and see through paradigms and their own inherent bias? I, I think that uh, merely by virtue of participating in the raw materials sector, uh, you're looking through uh, all of the temporary paradigms uh, that, that, that grab a hold of the attention of investors. So this has not been a loved sector for many years now. I think perhaps its last great year was 2010. And the narrative that supported commodities investing was the China super cycle and endless urbanization in the developing world. And that, that narrative uh, broke down uh, and at, 
that really after the Beijing Olympics. So I suppose there's little danger if you're per- participating in commodities and raw materials. Uh, there's little danger that you've actually been been grabbed by one of these short-term paradigms. And of course, the one that we've all watched, uh, well, I personally have watched and not taken advantage of was the no, no prices is, is too much to pay for growth paradigm uh, that, that uh, paradoxically, paradoxically came into existence uh, after COVID. And I guess the assumption was that rates would be zero forever and that <clears throat> even if uh, Tesla isn't going to make money for 50 years, or free cash flow, I should say, for 50 years, or Uber wasn't going to make money for 30 years, or Palantir wasn't going to make money for 20 years, or Zillow wasn't going to make money for 15 years. But they were going to, like Amazon, with all this cheap capital, grab markets, dominate them, and develop a small monopoly power, and you needed to pay for that. And uh, that went uh, on for longer and to higher levels than I would ever have thought. Uh, and now it's breaking. Uh, so I, I don't have an answer to, um, to how you avoid getting caught in, in, in those narratives, getting absorbed by them. Uh, in fact, having not participated in it, I think was a mistake on my part because it seemed uh, obvious, uh, that, that momentum was building there. And even if ultimately you're right, that an asset is overvalued, can stay overvalued for, for a very long time. So I think it's important to step back and understand where popular psychology is going and think about how early you are in the story uh, and, and invest accordingly. Uh, and how do you, uh, how do you leave early uh, having made money? Well, that's a challenge that uh, I'm not sure I have a, uh, a complete answer to at the moment. I was just I had a conversation actually this morning on this very same topic, Brian, my, my partner, uh, one of the most brilliant investors I've ever met in my career, my partner at Bastion Asset Management, we just started uh, three months ago. And you think one of the biggest strengths of a good investor is amount flexibility. And to, like you'd be flexible and to constantly challenge your assumptions and those paradigms. It's very easy to get anchored, you know, growth at any price. If you held that view for the last eight years, you made buckets of money. Very hard for investors to challenge a paradigm when they're on a big wave and winning well. Or at the same time, when you're, when you're down, it's a challenge. Am I right? Am I, do I have, do, do I still hold these convictions and test constantly test them having the flexibility to admit you're wrong or to get off the bus when you're right. And you know, maybe the party's over. So that's something really, really important. So constantly challenging your paradigms, challenging your assumptions, being flexible enough to go back to something that hurt you in the past or made money in the past and you were wrong and just be constantly emotionally intellectually curious enough and emotionally strong enough to go back to those places. Uh, that's a, a real strength. And I think if markets get more and more volatile in the future, those, those are going to be key attributes of stuff that would be the most successful. They're able to change their paradigms, understand things are moving quickly and be able to adjust uh, to new realities faster than those are anchored in their, in their views. Yeah. You couldn't have, you couldn't have more resources uh, at your command than Tiger Global or Dragon, Dragoneer or Kotsu or, or SoftBank, to be frank, to make decisions about the direction of, of markets. And yet all of those uh, funds or businesses uh, have, have have watched fifty to sixty percent of the value of their investments completely vaporize in a short period of time. So it's a, a really tough thing for even the best investors and investors with tremendous amount of resources uh, at their beck and call uh, to make those decisions. It, it's it's it can't be underestimated. It's really really tough. And I, I I guess that's a way for me to say that I agree wholeheartedly with Mike. Really, every day you need to question whether or not uh, there is something that you're missing. Brian, to follow up on that? Uh, yeah. So while paradigms and bias give us the basis for how we live and view the world, emotion is the fuel that causes us to act without logic. The biggest lesson I've learned in my speculating career thus far is to act against the crowd and buy when everyone else is selling and vice versa. Um, and it's, it's definitely a lot easier said than done. Um, do you have a defined strategy that works to minimize the role of emotion uh, plays in your investments? And My either- wife. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because she, she D- Dave, Dave, on that point, because your wife can read you better than anybody, right? So she, she picks up on your emotional state and gives you feedback. Is that what you mean? My wife is a great business person. Uh, on her own, uh, very successful uh, in at, at what she does, and uh, is a great athlete and very accomplished in 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 life. And 
And it's important to have someone in your life uh, who reminds you that you don't know everything and that, uh, and that, and that uh, your decisions need to be reviewed and questioned on a regular basis. And I'm being moderately facetious, although the, all this is true. Uh, but but uh, um, I, I think uh, moving away from that subject for the moment, I, I think one thing that I like to do is go through my portfolio on a regular basis and look at the things I've lost money on uh, and review the notes that I made and, and the mistakes that I made uh, and think it, uh, about, about how wrong I was and why I was wrong and dwell on those decisions. Uh, it's all of the mistakes you've made that are the most valuable, uh, uh sources of learning uh, for an investor. And you're constantly making them the minute you, you think you've got to a place where you've got it dialed in, you're at your most vulnerable as an investor. Brian, your question on, on emotional or control. I mean, I went. I, had a, I taught at the university for ten years, moonlighting in one class, and I had the good fortune one year my students got invited to meet Warren Buffett uh, for lunch at his uh-huh. famous steakhouse with his cherry coke, and I had twenty five students with me, and they got to ask him questions for three hours. Really impressive. He took three hours worth of questions that in the eighties, an eighty year old uh, guy, and just sharp as attacked. Uh-huh. But one person asked him, you know, what's the best number one attribute you need to be a successful investor. And, and he actually said, you know, if you have an IQ of 180, that does not guarantee that you're going to be a great investor. He said, I take an IQ of 130, but someone has a very high EI and mastery of his emotions and can stay calm and controlled in the storm. That That's how you become, obviously the skills of understanding how to invest in the financial whatever, but really the emotional mastery of your emotions with a moderately high IQ versus a very high IQ and no EI. He said, oh, we'll never touch someone like that. And so it was a pretty uh, illustrative answer to your question. I think that's few people can stay calm in the storm or, or stay level-headed and humble and when things are going really well. And, and those, those are the ones that really can take advantage of the extremes in the market and, and do really well. So it's, it's an underrated skill uh, in the market for sure. It's extremely important to go back and look at your investment successes as well as your mistakes and try to separate out uh, uh, where you, you were successful because of deliberate plans and intelligent decisions and where you got lucky. Mm-hmm. And luck is an incredibly important part of investing. And from a corporate standpoint, I think that the job of a strategic investor is to help a company uh, protect uh, its, its opportunity to benefit from luck. And that's largely down to financing it intelligently, putting the right people into the business, not, uh, not, not put it, make, make sure the company doesn't have to finance during difficult markets and, uh, and, and making sure that that the structure of the company is such that when luck arrives, it can be properly reflected in the stock price. But for individual investors, you should also go back and analyze the role that luck played in your success uh, and uh, acknowledge that, that it wasn't all you. So the famous Rick uh, ruleism, don't confuse a bull market with brains, right? Is applicable here. <laughs> really? <laughs> Uh, I, love, I, love Dave's, I love Dave's comment on, on learning from your mistakes. I, I mentioned I'm old school. I write everything by hand. So my old files in my institutional uh, job days, you know, the files that you lost money in always were like 35 times thicker than the ones you made money on. That, that you, buy, you buy a stock, it's in a bull market, it goes up, commodities ripping, you know, you, your file is very skin, skinny and you feel really smart. The one where you've lost money, it's pages and pages of analysis, is conference calls, talking to management, what's went wrong, excuse number 47 on why they're not executing on their plan. So today's point, the ones you learn about are the ones that you lost money on because you go, go through those files and go, I missed that, I missed that, I ignored that red flag. I, I, the management lied to me for a third time and I still didn't sell the stock. I bought the, the line again. So those, those files where you've lost money, really what you learn, the ones that go straight up, you know, you're probably more lucky than good in those cases. Uh, and if you, you know, or your thesis worked out so quickly that you didn't even have time to know you were right. Uh, so those, those losing investments are actually your PhD or your masterclass in uh, investing. You learn so much from those. Well, gentlemen, any, any concluding remarks? I appreciate this hour you've spent with us today. Uh, Michael, any final thoughts on what we've shared or the markets in general? No, just really, really enjoy being on. I think it's, these are really great questions and, and really important for investors to think through. And thanks for giving them a forum to be able to think through them in a really rational and calm way. Yeah. And Dave, anything as we conclude? No. No, just uh, thanks so much again, Bill and Brian, for uh, for producing these educational pieces for investors. I think they're tremendously valuable for the space. And thank you for your contribution, Dave, Michael, and Brian. And we'll call that a wrap. And thank you again, gentlemen. 